Now for one of our main events. Um, this is something I watched the other day. Jordan Peterson's critique of the Communist Manifesto from his debate with Slavoj Žižek. I don't know why I clicked on this the other day, but I, I did. And it was a great mistake. Two minutes in, I realized Peterson had no idea what he was talking about. He had yeah, never engaged we... with Marx before deciding to do a debate about Marx. I think the Communist Manifesto might be the only book that Jordan Peterson ever read of Marx. And then he just was like, I'm an expert now. You know, I'm an expert philosopher. Screw people like John Paul Sartre and Louis Althusser and all these genius philosophers of the last 100 years who have dedicated their lives to reading Marx, you know, and, and building on Marx's work. All you got to do is read the Communist Manifesto and then say it's dumb on your YouTube channel and you're a genius ana or, uh, academic like Jordan Peterson. <laughs> so, you know, the Communist Manifesto, it does have Marxist philosophy in it. It does lay out the basics of Marxist philosophy, but it's mostly a political program, right? It's mostly, it was mostly just written to get workers hyped up, right? It was, it was yeah, written we... as like an agitation pamphlet to be like, this is what communists should do. There is a specter haunting Europe. The specter of communism, the specter of the working class. Like, let's get it. Let's go. Workers of the world unite. That is what Marx is saying here. He isn't laying out his, yeah, his full philosophy. He does that in Capital's volume, or Capital Volume 1 through 3, which is over 2,000 pages of, of economic investigation. But Peterson didn't even engage with that. He just read the 30-page manifesto and assumed he was good. Like, I just can't, I know it's Jordan Peterson, right? I know he's a reactionary. I know he's dumb. But I just can't even wrap my mind around being that intellectually lazy, right? Like that being so intellectually lazy that you believe yourself to be the master critic of Marxism and you think you can debate Marxism in front of millions and millions of people and everyone should take you serious and listen to what you say and you're a really smart guy and you didn't even read what Marx had to say. You didn't even do the homework. <laughs> You need to clean your room and read some Marx, JP. So let's watch this, and I'll talk about what's wrong. Instead, was returned to what I regarded as the original cause of all the trouble, let's say, which was the Communist Manifesto. And what I attempted to do... The original cause of all the trouble was the Communist Manifesto. Really, it was the one pamphlet that Marx wrote, not his entire philosophy, not the bulk of his philosophy. The main problem was just that one book, the Manifesto. Because that's Marx, and we're here to talk about Marxism, let's say. And um, what I tried to do was read it, and to read something. He also tries to sound so smart with his speech pattern. It annoys me so much. <laughs> and, and so many academics do this, like, oh, yes, uh, uh, we're here to talk about Marxism, let's say. And uh, let's say if I uh, never read Marx, um, these are my uh, problems with it, let's say. Uh, and, and one thing that Marx never considered was uh, human nature, let's say. You're not smart. You're not saying anything smart or interesting. Thing. You don't just follow the words and follow the meaning, but you take apart the sentences and you ask yourself at this level of phrase and at the level of sentence and at the level of paragraph, is this true? Are there counter... Thank you for explaining how reading works. I put multiple words together and then that makes a sentence. I'm kind of a crazy genius. Yeah, I, I know how to read, Jordan. Arguments that can be put forward that are credible. Is this solid thinking? And I have to tell you, and I'm not trying to be flippant here, that I have rarely read a tract. Now, I read it when I was 18. It was a long time ago. Like, that's 40 years ago. But I've rarely read a tract that made as many errors per sentence, conceptual errors per sentence, as the Communist Manifesto. It was quite a miraculous reread. It, and it, it was interesting to think and about... And that's a classic debating trick, too. So you make an appeal to, you know, he, he hasn't gone into the specifics yet, He's just said, in the abstract, you know, there's nothing, or the Communist Manifesto just makes all these conceptual errors. You know, an abstract claim, and he's going to go into his evidence here soon, but his evidence is super faulty, you know, and, and he's setting the stage by making this broad claim um, about the Manifesto, just to get people to think it's ridiculous. You know, Marxism is so ridiculous, you shouldn't take it seriously, you know, you shouldn't take the time to study it. Um, which is largely the strategy of the ruling class, right? They just tell you that Marxism never worked, it never worked, it never worked. Don't even read it. Because they know if you read it, you're going to realize it makes a lot of sense and it shows why our system is so messed up and, and why capitalism has so many contradictions. And you're going to go, oh, I'm a Marxist. So they just say, don't read it, don't read it, doesn't make sense. You know, none of the concepts make sense. Please, 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 please don't read the manifesto. Please don't read Marx. 
about it psychologically as well, because I've read student papers that were of the same ilk in some sense, although I'm not suggesting that they were of the same level of glittery. And then that's a... Uh, literary brilliance and... So then that's an appeal to authority, right? Or an appeal to the establishment. Like, oh, I've read student papers that are worse than this. You know, I'm an academic. I'm a professor. My title makes me smart. You know, but my students, they're dumb, and, and I'd put marks down there with my students. Appeal to authority. Polemic quality. And I also understand that the Communist Manifesto was a call for revolution and not a standard logical argument. But that notwithstanding, True. I have some things to say about the authors psychologically. The first thing is that... So, if it was a call to revolution and it wasn't his main ideas or his main investigation, why is that what you're talking about in a debate about Marxism? Why aren't you talking about the actual ideas? Why aren't you steel manning your opponent's argument so you can actually engage with them? It seems like you're just cherry picking uh, one of Marx's works that, that doesn't have that much to do with his actual philosophy. It doesn't seem to me that either Marx or Engels grappled with one fundamental, with this particular fundamental truth, which is that um, almost all ideas are wrong. And so if you, and it doesn't matter if they're your ideas or someone else's ideas, they're probably wrong. And even if they strike you with the force of brilliance, your job is to assume, first of all, that they're probably wrong, and then to assault them with everything you have in your arsenal and see if they can survive. And what So that is so insane to me. This is how two minutes in I could tell that he'd never read Marx in his life. Because Marx and Engels, when they started espousing the philosophy of materialism, you know, meaning the concrete world around us is real, and we can investigate it using our sentences, the implication then is ruthless critique of everything. You know, proposing, at, er, uh, critiquing every single idea because most ideas about the world are wrong. You know, and the way that you get to the, uh, the right ideas is through thorough investigation over time and debate over time, which is why Mao famously said, no critique, no investigation. You know, if you haven't investigated something, if you haven't looked into something, you have no right to talk about it. Um, and, and every single idea, every single idea is up for ruthless critique and needs to be debated. This is one of the core, the core principles of Marxism. If you read almost any Marxist text from Marx, Engels, Mao, Lenin, they're going to talk about ruthlessly critiquing every idea. You know, and how academics like to sit in their bubble, you know, and just believe what they believe. And, and oftentimes they cling to outdated ideas because of their, you know, because of personal reasons. They just want to cling to what they believe is right, you know, rather than um, challenging their own ideas and critiquing their own ideas. And it's hilarious that Peterson is saying Marx, you know, Marx and Engels never took this into account when Marx and Engels wrote about it so much. When he's the one who lives in his little academic bubble and has never really challenged his belief system by engaging with Marx and really getting deeply into Marx and challenging these silly liberal ideas that are in his head. Um, so it's, it's utter projection. What struck me about the Communist Manifesto was it was akin to something Jung said about typical thinking, and this was the thinking of people who weren't trained to think. He said that the typical thinker has a thought, it appears to them like an object might appear in a room, the thought appears, and then they just, they just accept it as, as true. They don't go the second. And Marx, <laughs> Marx spent so much time in, in libraries, going through ac accounting books, going through old economics textbooks that nobody read, reading all of the major philosophers of his time, all of them. He was, you know, and this is one thing that, that people say when they read Capital, even if they're not Marxist, they go, Marx read everything. You know, the, the amount of, like, he had, he had even read famous nonfiction books from his time. And, like, famously, there's a bunch of references to Frankenstein um, and, and vampires in uh, Capital because he's trying to make the book interesting, and he's talking about the, the literature at his time. He was one of the most well-read people in the world. You know, so this idea that he just didn't subject any ideas to criticism, the whole way that he came up with his philosophy was trying to read everything that had been published around his time and subject it all to the most ruthless criticism. That is the whole point of Marxism, you absolute numbnuts. Second step, which is to think about the thinking. And that's the real essence of critical thinking. And think so about that's the what thinking. you try to teach people. In that's the Marxist method, is to say, how do we think about things? How do we engage with things? Please, just read the German ideology. Two pages of the German ideology would have told you this, Jordan. That he's, he's literally saying, how do we engage with things? How do we think about things? You know, and what he does is critique idealism. You know, he critiques the ideas we construct in our head and this idea that, you know, uh, we come up with our ideas in our head 
and then you know we we emit them onto reality right the ideas in our head then become reality mark says no it is the opposite you know it is humans who exist as material beings within reality right and reality is real we can sense it and touch it using our human senses and we can interact with reality using human labor so then as philosophers and historians and uh politi or people um studying politics when we look at society and analyze society we need to understand it that way we need to understand that humans are interacting with the world based on their or using labor and then human societies then can be built around that labor and and on the production of goods he's he's literally talking about how humans think and you're saying marx never took into account how they think he just thought all ideas were correct fool universities to read a text and to think about it critically not to destroy the utility of the text but to separate the wheat from the chaff and so what I tried to do when I was reading the Communist Manifesto was to separate the wheat from the chaff. And I'm afraid I found some wheat, yes, but mostly chaff. And I'm going to explain why. Um, Please get into uh, it. Well, Please stop meandering. You're so annoying. To be short order. So I'm going to outline ten of the fundamental axioms of the Communist Manifesto. And so these are truths that are basically held as self-evident by the authors. And um, they're truths that are presented in some sense as unquestioned. And I'm going to question them and tell you why I think they're... Um, unreliable. Now we should remember that this tract was actually written 170 years ago. That's a long time ago. And we have learned a fair bit from since then about human nature, about society, about politics, about economics. There's lots of mysteries human left. Human nature, basic economics. You're a middle schooler. You're a middle schooler masquerading as an intelligent academic. To be unsolved, but left to be solved, but we are slightly wiser, I presume, than we were at one point. And so you can forgive the authors to some degree for what they didn't know, but that doesn't matter given that the essence of this doctrine is still held as sacrosanct by a large proportion of academics. Probably um, are it's among the really most. not. The, the manifesto is not an academic text. I mean, maybe these truths he's about to, to list are, are held as true by academics, but, like, academics don't, don't study the manifesto. I mean, they have, but it's, like I said, it was a political program that's 30 pages long. Academic Study Capital, a book that Jordan Peterson probably couldn't get through. What would you call guilty of that particular sin? So here's proposition number one. History is to be viewed primarily as an economic class struggle. All right, so, so let's think about that for a minute. Um, first of all, is there the proposition there is that history is primarily to be viewed through an economic lens, and I think that's a debatable proposition because there are many other motivations that drive human beings than economics, and those have to be taken into and Marx talked about that too, the superstructure conditions the base. Economics are the base because like I explained to you, Jordan, humans interact with uh, the environment around us through labor, right? We use our hands and our brains to turn like trees into wood and then we use that wood to build houses, right? And that creates civilization. So, you know, civilization is based around the production and reproduction of human life, which requires human labor. There's also political structures, legal structures, religious structures, uh, cultural structures, and these all influence economics, and economics deeply influence all of these things. It's a genius way of analyzing and looking at society, you know, and it, it can tell us many, many things about societies. Um, and never, never does Marx say that it's only economics, right? It's only economics that, that causes society to change. Right, that is never something Marx even gets close to saying, right? The base conditions the superstructure and the superstructure conditions the base. You know, but what's important is that all societies are based around economics and capitalism is based around an exploiting class who doesn't work yet takes all the money and a, an exploited class, the majority of society who works and has their money taken from them, has the surplus value of their labor taken from them. And that is an incredibly irrational way and anarchic way to analyze or to uh, organize society. To account, especially to drive people other than economic competition, like economic cooperation, for example. And so that's a problem. The other problem is that it's actually not. A what does he say there? I want to listen to that again, because Marx talks a lot about economic cooperation. There are many other motivations that drive human beings than economics, and those have to be taken into account, especially that drive people other than economic competition, like economic cooperation, for example. And so that's a problem. Marx has a whole chapter in Capital called Cooperation. 
It's, it's basically just about the beginning of economic co cooperation, like the very beginning, like when humans first started organizing themselves into societies to, to cooperate. And then how under feudalism, you know, you had the formation of these manufacturing guilds, basically like uh, guilds that, that created um, clothing and, and, you know, iron goods or bronze goods, depending on what uh, point in human history it was. And, and those cooperative manufacturing guilds are what became later under capitalism the factory, right? The factory system, which caused or led to more cooperation, right? Led to a mass concentration of workers in the cities cooperating together to make a profit for the capitalist. So there was massive increased worker cooperation um, uh, as capitalism came about at the same time where you have competition between workers. Right? Workers are now competing with each other to try and get more wages, to try and be more valuable to the boss so they can be favored by the boss. So you have this contradictory motion where there's more cooperation in the labor, but there's also more competition. Um, and this is something Marx talks about a ton. And again, he's so confidently up here in front of thousands, millions of people saying, you know, oh, Marx never took cooperation into account. Like, just do a Google search, homie. The other problem is that it's actually not... A nearly a pessimistic enough um, description of the actual problem, because history, history, this is to give the devil his due, the idea that one of the driving forces between history is hierarchical struggle is absolutely true. But the idea that that's actually history is not true, because it's deeper than history, it's biology itself, because organisms of all sorts organize themselves into hierarchies, and one of the problems with hierarchies is that they tend to arrange themselves into a winner-take-all situation. And so, and that, that is implicit in some sense in Marx, Marx's thinking, because of course Marx believed that in a capitalist society, capital would accumulate in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And that actually is in keeping with the nature of hierarchical organizations. Now, the problem with that isn't so much the fact of, the, so there's, the, there's accuracy in the accusation that that is an eternal form of motivation for struggle, but it's an underestimation of the seriousness of the problem, because it attributes it to the structure of human societies, rather than the deeper reality of the existence of hierarchical structures per se, which, as they also characterize the animal kingdom to a large degree, are clearly not only human constructions. And the idea So this is basically, you know, the age-old argument, human nature. You know, humans are inherently hierarchical, so therefore we have to remain w under capitalism, right? We can't fix it at all. We just have to allow capital to accumulate, right? We can't, we can't do anything about it. We can't, you know, and, and Marx agreed, you know, Marx never said there's going to be a, a society with no hierarchies, right? That's an anarchistic idea. But capitalism is incredibly irrational. Capitalism continually concentrates wealth in fewer and fewer hands and allows wealth to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and allows the people who own that wealth to control entirely our political systems, our legal systems, our justice system. Um, which is, you know, the reason that uh, American capitalism has been so inefficient at handling the, the COVID pandemic, right? Because we have a country that only knows how to do one thing, generate profits. It doesn't know how to take care of people, right? That's what our economic system, that's what the economic base of our society does. It generates profits, which is, you know, an, terrible in a, in a public health crisis. Um, and so, you know, they want you to believe that this very specific system capitalism where capitalists extract surplus value by exploiting the labor of workers you know because humans are inherently uh, competitive or whatever because human societies have have been hi hierarchical generally if you totally ignore um, primitive communist societies um, that we just have to accept capitalism it's like even if that was true even if humans are entirely hierarchical we can still have a, a less rigid hierarchy than this Right, we can still have a, a hierarchy where 99% or I mean where 1% uh, of the richest people um, don't own more wealth than the bottom 50% of society combined because that's what we have right now. So even if you believe that humans are like inherently, you know, hierarchical and we're always going to and that means we're always going to have capitalists, you should still be like a social democrat, right? You should still be like, "Okay, but we should have checks and balances so that the hierarchy doesn't get too rigid." Um, but yeah, it's a ridiculous idea overall. Right, because you can have workers take power over the capitalists and then form themselves into different hierarchies, right? But hierarchies of the working class, of the masses who actually labor, not hierarchy as in like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk just rule above us like overlords or Zuckerberg. The idea that there's hierarchical competition among human beings, there's evidence for that that goes back at least to the Paleolithic times. And so that's the next problem. Is that actually, that's not true. The, the most recent scholarly... Um, research in anthropology 
has shown that human societies originated in Africa. And more and more, based on the, the bones and the um, tools and, and other things that are being found by scientists, these societies began communally. There was no state, right? There was no, basically no hierarchy. Division of labor was just based on, you know, women. Uh, uh, it was based on, based on the sexes, right, um, is, is what they think. But uh, it wasn't a division of labor based on class, you know. So there were societies without these, these rigid hierarchies that existed. And there's been tons of scholarship, especially within the last two years, that have, have confirmed this. Um, there's a really good critique of David Graeber's recent new book where he basically argues that humans have always been hierarchical um, and that there has always been some form of the state. Um, there's two really, really good rebuttals to that um, using recent anthropological research that basically disproves everything JP is saying here. Well, the, this ancient problem of hierarchical structure is clearly not attributable to capitalism because it existed long in human history before capitalism existed, and then it predated human history itself. So the question no, then arises, why would you necessarily... No, it didn't. You haven't looked into prehistory. And, and Marx and Engels wrote so much about prehistory. The, they came up with their idea of communism after studying uh, prehistoric communities and primitive communist societies and indigenous societies. Dude, you didn't do the bare minimum of research. I just... I can't believe how little he engaged with Marx before doing a debate in front of millions of people. He's in front of millions of people talking about Marxism and, and he hasn't read a chapter. <laughs> I can't believe it because it's his own channel. Yeah. I guess he can get away with saying anything to the Jordan Peterson audience. We'll watch just a little more, but I'm getting bored. Necessarily, at least implicitly, link the class struggle with capitalism, given that it's a far deeper problem. And now, it's also, you've got to understand that this is a deeper problem for people on the left, not just for people on the right. It is the case that hierarchical structure, you necessarily, at least implicitly, link the class struggle with capitalism, given that it's a far deeper problem. And now, it's also long in human history before capitalism existed, and then it predated human history itself. So the question then arises, why would you necessarily, at least implicitly, link the class struggle with capitalism, given... Oh my... Did he really just say that? Did he really just say, because class struggle has always existed, why would you link it with capitalism? Because that's the system we live under. Because that's the system that was emerging and coming about when Marx was writing. So if the class struggle has existed for all of human history in all of these different economic systems, it's still going to exist under capitalism. And that's what Marx is saying, you idiot. He's saying that human societies progress through different modes of production. And there was class struggle under feudalism. You know, there was class struggle under slave societies. And class struggles and class uprisings are what led to societal changes. What led to major societal changes. Look at the French and American revolutions. Where uh, class struggles that overthrew feudalism. Or the, or the uh, Bolivar's revolution in Latin America. These were class struggles that led to the end of feudalism. So if class struggle has always existed, and you admit that, it's going to exist under capitalism too. And Marx, that is one of Marx's main points, is that societies progress through different modes of production, not just capitalism. But right now, that's not going to stop. The class struggle is going to continue, and we're going to continue advancing through modes of production out of capitalism. Just like we've advanced out of modes of production through all of human history. I cannot believe he just said that. I'm glad we, we kept going with this video because that was the most absurd thing he said so far. <laughs> that it's a far deeper problem. And now, it's also, you've got to understand that this is a deeper problem for people on the left, not just for people on the right. It is the case that hierarchical structures dispossess those people who are at the bottom, those creatures who are at the bottom, speaking, say, of animals, but those people who are at the bottom, and that that is a fundamental existential problem. But the other thing that Marx didn't seem to take into account is that there, there, there are far more reasons that human beings struggle than their economic class struggle, even if you build the... Marx didn't take into account. Marx didn't take into account. All right, if anyone still believes this uh, nonsense... We have a whole video on it about why Marxism isn't reductionist and why Marx doesn't just base everything on the class struggle. Um, this is one about it. Studies beyond the unilateral theory of history. Um, is Marxism reductive, though? This is the one that talks about 
how Marx doesn't say it's only economics that move history, right? He says that economics are the base of society, but uh, that means that economics influence political, legal, religious, cultural structures, but the political, religious, legal, and cultural structures also influence economics. It works both ways. Um, so this, this argument that Marx was reductive and he thought only economics uh, um, were what drive society and change society, anybody who argues that is a fool who hasn't read Marx and is talking out of their ass. And that's exactly what Jordan Peterson is. Hierarchical idea into that, which is a more comprehensive way of thinking about it. Human beings struggle with themselves, with the malevolence that's inside themselves, with the evil that they're capable of doing, with the spirit. I wonder what Zizek is thinking right now. He's going to be like, what is this man on? How am I even supposed to respond to this? And Zizek was a coward in this debate, low-key. Zizek should have flamed this man. He should have showed no mercy. ...and psychological warfare that goes on within them. And we're also actually always at odds with nature. And this never seems to show up in Marx. And it doesn't show up in Marxist, Marxism. Oh, uh... Oh, pain. It never shows up in Marx that we engage with nature. What about... The, the whole purpose of Marx, everything Marx ever wrote, is about human labor, which is how humans use our material bodies to interact with nature. And Marx even talks about metabolic rift in, in the natural processes, which nowadays has, has spurred a whole nother uh, field of thought called Marxist ecology. And there's genius thinkers like John Bellamy Foster and Ian Angus who use Marx's work about how humans interact with nature to talk about climate change and to talk about modern ecological phenomena because Marx's analysis was so good and it was so thorough and it so deeply understood how humans interact with nature that it's still valuable today, that we can expand deeply on that work today and understand the ecological crises that we're facing. The whole purpose of you know Marxism is looking at how humans interact with nature through our labor. And, and he just said Marx never took into account how humans interact with nature. Holy shit, dude. What a fraud. What a absolute fraud. I mean, that is almost sad. Like, in the recent... A Marxist response to Jordan Peterson. I have not seen this, but we can watch this for a bit. I'm done with JP. I'm not watching that anymore. <laughs> Dude, I can't. I can't watch it after he said, Marx never took into account how humans interact with nature. ...debate between Dr. Slavok Zizek and Dr. Jordan Peterson, the latter provided 10 arguments to refute Marxism. He said that Marx was a narcissist and that the Communist Manifesto was no better than a bad undergraduate level essay. My name is Temur Rahman. I'm Associate Professor of Political Science at the Lahore University of Management Sciences in Pakistan. And I'm going to try to prove to you that Dr. Peterson attacks Marxism only by presenting a caricature of the complex thoughts of Marx and Engels. I am grateful to Dr. Peterson for putting together all the commonplace objections to Marxism that are found in society and uh, also in the academy. It gives me the opportunity. That is, that's what it was. Jordan Peterson literally gave like the middle school arguments that have been used against Marx for the last 200 years. And uh, John Paul Sartre has a good quote. I can't remember how exactly it goes, but it's like, you know, once you've... Uh, thoroughly understood Marx, you know, you realize that, that, um, it's like every idea or, um, yeah, against Marx is just the reformulation of an older idea that Marx already destroyed. It's basically what Sartre says, but what he means is all these objections, you know, human nature, humans are inherently hierarchical, um, Marx never took into account how humans, you know, never took nature into account. They're all nonsense. Marx did analyze these things and he analyzed them in depth. Um, which is the, basically the point of that Sartre quote. And, you know, you see a perfect example of it there with Peterson as, uh, as um, this Dr. Rahman is saying. You know, Peterson basically just uh, repeated using more words and, and while trying to sound like a smart guy, all the, the age-old critiques of Marx that have been made for the last 150 years.
opportunity to address them in one go. But I have reorganized his uh, 10 arguments into three broad themes. The first is his remarks on class and history. Secondly, his remarks on capitalism. And last but not least, his remarks on the dictatorship of the proletariat. Let's begin with his first remarks on class and history. History is to be viewed primarily as an economic class struggle. And I think that's a debatable proposition because there are many other motivations that drive human beings than economics and economic reductions. But let's read what this is a familiar argument and a familiar charge against Marxism, the charge of economic reductionism. And guess who's got a, a video called Why Marxism Isn't Reductionist? Your boys at Midwestern Marx, Carlos Garrido, baby, that's who. Economic reductionism. But let's read what Marx had to say in the Communist Manifesto itself. He wrote, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. He didn't say economic class struggles, nor did he say that it's the history only of economic struggles. He follows this up later on in the manifesto by saying, man's ideas, views, and... And that's true. Another point is Marx identifies the first economic classes as, like, men and women. Because the first division of labor was between men and women. You know, men have these jobs, women have, have these jobs, more related to childbirth. That was, like, the first division of labor in human society. Um, and human societies began as matriarchal. Right, because they didn't have monogamous marriage, because people had multiple sexual partners within the community, you couldn't tell necessarily which kids belonged to which men. But you could always tell which kids belonged to which women because women birthed the kids. So lineage was traced through the woman, which made those societies uh, matriarchal rather than patriarchal. But once uh, you have that class division between men and women, and men now have the incentive to uh, have inheritance go through the, the male bloodline so that they can pass their resources and their, their goods, their wealth, down to their sons, that's when you have the beginning of the patriarchy. So the class antagonism that is created by the division of society into two classes um, causes a class struggle, which leads to changes in society. And it was a division based on gender, right? Not necessarily these strict economic classes. Um, yeah. Conception in one word, man's consciousness changes with every change in the conditions of his material existence, in his social relations, and in his social life. As you can see from this quotation, man's ideas are not purely driven or only driven by economic considerations, but by man's material existence and social relations and social life as a whole. That's a much broader category than the category purely of economic relations. The charge of economic reductionism was, in fact, an argument that was raised during the time of Marx and Engels. And Engels responded to this. So going back to that Sartre quote. Right, the quote I said where every argument against Marx is just a reformulation of a previous idea. That's what he's basically saying right here. This was, you know, a charge that people were making in Marx's time. Marx engaged with this heavily. Jordan Peterson just never read Marx like a middle schooler. Explicitly in the following passage where he wrote, and I quote, According to the materialist conception of history, the ultimately determining element in history is the production and reproduction of real life. Other than this, neither Marx nor I have ever asserted. Hence, if somebody twists this into saying that the economic element is the only determining one, he transforms that proposition into a meaningless, abstract, senseless phrase. It's very clear from this passage, from this letter. Get wrecked, Jordan Peterson. Get wrecked by Ingalls. So that's what, you know, that's what John Paul Sartre means. He doesn't mean Marx is a god. He doesn't mean Marx has answered every single question that humans have ever asked. What he means is these lame arguments made by people like Jordan Peterson are things that Marx and Engels engaged with thoroughly, right? And oftentimes, uh, these, these accusations against Marx, like he never took human nature into account, are just lies, right? Are just smears of his actual work. Written in 1890, that Marx and Engels never proposed that economic motivations are the only motivations that explain history or politics. Beautiful. I'll have to watch that whole video later. 